Hello, my name is Cody Short, and I am an astrodynamic software engineer at Analytical Graphics. I've been here for a couple of years now, and I work on the Astrogator module with an SDK. Um, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about in terms of rendezvous and proximity operations uh, is done with Astrogator, and so I'll talk about it in, in that context and, and some of the reasons why you might want to do that. So to begin with, uh, I just want to go through some of the notions in the background of rendezvous and proximity operations. And so basically the notion is that whenever we're talking about rendezvous or prox ops, we're talking about um, bringing one spacecraft near to another spacecraft. In terms of rendezvous, we're going to bring them to the same place at the same time. Uh, in terms of proximity operations, we're going to bring one spacecraft next to another, another and, and do maneuvers about it. In terms of proximity operations, when we're talking about um, the inner satellite distances um, and velocity differences, we're talking about the order of kilometers and uh, meters per second. And with all of this, we can be doing these in two different ways. We can do it in terms of cooperative rendezvous and prox ops or non-cooperative rendezvous and prox ops. Um, when we talk about cooperative, that just means that we have more perfect information about how we're moving and, and where we're at and how the other satellite is moving and where it's at. Now when I say more perfect information, it's not perfect, it's just much better because we cooperate and we know that information. Um, in terms of non-cooperative, we may not know where, say, our target vehicle is or our target object is, uh, but we typically know where we're at to some degree of certainty. And so that's the kind of the notion there. Um, in this process, we don't necessarily have to be a person in the loop all the time. We can also do this as in terms of autonomous rendezvous and prox ops. Um, so that's when we use onboard software to help us do the, the operations that we need to do. Along with this, we have a lot of different terminology that we use. So in terms of the roles of the satellites and the vehicles, um, we might be referring to a chief and a deputy, a uh, target or a chaser. Um, and there's lots of different terminology that, that's, that's in the vernacular. Over all of this, there are a number of challenges that we do have to deal with. Um, chief among those challenges is the notion of knowing where we're at, knowing where our satellite is or where our vehicle is and where the object of interest is. And we don't always know that as well as we'd like to. Um, for example, there's a, a collision hazard that's, that we're trying to avoid. And um, during the demonstration of autonomous and rendezvous technology spacecraft mission in 2005, the, the spacecraft actually ran into the, the, the target vehicle. Um, so during that demonstration mission. So this is what we're trying to avoid. So we need to be able to know where we're at and uh, where our target is. There are a number of use cases in this regime. Um, so in terms of rendezvous and prox ops use cases, we're always talking about things like um, on-orbit on servicing, um, mission life extension. One of the classic examples of a RPO use case was the servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope. So, so we put the mirror up there, put the, the telescope up there, and the mirror wasn't quite right. And so the astronauts went back and fixed it. And they visited a number of times to do that. And to do all of this, there's a notion of being able to get to there uh, and do the things that we need to do in, in those types of operations. Um, the notion of transferring things between vehicles, say if we're bringing uh, astronauts to the space station, uh, one of the really recent things that we've seen is the uh, debris removal use case. So the Remove Debris mission in 2018, where we went out and demonstrated the ability to be able to pick up uh, space junk throughout a net and caught something. Um, and that's another particular use case there. Um, other things like rendezvousing with asteroids and comets, those are missions that are of interest more and more. Uh, <coughs> one, of the, one of the really big use cases, or one of the more important use cases, uh, and kind of why I think a lot of us are more interested in these types of operations, is the intelligence gathering and, and kind of knowing where, where our assets are and where other people's assets are. And so just kind of as an example, um, in 2015, we observed the Luch spacecraft uh, perform rendezvous and prox ops uh, near another satellite. It came in and got really close, and flew around there for a while, um, and then it actually moved again to go and, and visit other satellites over the course of time. I mean, it's actually very recently been doing the same thing, uh, just this year. 
The purpose was never really clarified. We didn't know that, like, they didn't tell us why they're doing this, uh, but kind of the, the sense is that they're trying to do some eavesdropping or uh, demonstrate the technology that they could do that. And so here's an example of, over time, that same Luch spacecraft visiting different satellites. Um, and the notion here is the, the, the spacecraft will go from one to the other, cuddle up next to its neighbors. Um, space cuddling, it's not as nice as it sounds, I believe. It's the, um, and so this is the sort of thing that we need to be able to understand. We need to be able to see that it, when it happens, um, be able to model the behavior, model the, the, the RPO things that are happening so that we can be able to react to those things. Um, yet another example is the SJ-17 incident. Uh, this happened uh, in March 2017. So if you look at the graph here on the left, you can see uh, in purple, SJ-17 as it's going along it's about its business, and then you see it maneuver and come closer to the, the satellite here in the green. Um, when we say today, that was today in 28th of March. So all of these types of things are of relevance and importance. We need to be able to respond to, to these incidents. Um, we need to be able to model them and capture the behavior because if we don't know the dynamics, if we don't know how these things are behaving, uh, then we're, we're kind of falling behind with that. Um, so this is actually taken from our Twitter feed, the AGI Twitter feed. Uh, so please like, follow, and subscribe. To do all of this, we need to have some notion of the mathematical model behind uh, the, the motion of the spacecraft, the dynamical model. And so here is one example of a formulation that we might use. Typically, we'd use uh, linear approximations like the hill kleheshi wilshire or schoner hempel equations. Um, these give us the ability to, with these linear approximations, be able to design controls uh, that work well against them. They allow for more rapid design of controls. Alternatively, we could go to the other end of the, of the spectrum and use some nonlinear models. Uh, and that gives us the notion or the ability to retain fidelity. So we can say, this is how the thing actually moved to a much better degree. Uh, we can model that better. But that also makes it more difficult for us to design control about it. So we have different options there. Um, and in all of these cases, we're going to formulate these different dynamical models in terms of relative orbital elements. Uh, we'll use the Gauss variational equations to do that. That allows us to be able to uh, understand the differences um, from different forces or different perturbations that go into the model. The control design, again, is going to be simpler because we're using the simpler formulation. Um, and we can swap in and out models as we need to. Many other representations are available, for, uh, for example, using the eccentricity inclination vector type approach. Um, so there's lots of different stuff out there. There's this reference um, that might be of interest to you. It's a comparison survey of the uh, different cases that, that are out there. So <coughs> once we're able to kind of get the notion of how do things move or how are we going to get our spacecraft to where we need to be or how is someone else's spacecraft coming up next to us. Um, we have to be able to model the, the guidance for that. We need to be able to understand as I approach, what do I need to do? What are the different options that I have there? And so typically we're going to get our, our states from some navigation unit. Um, from that, we're going to need to know what our states are in terms of their uncertainty, how far off we might be, how close we are. And then we're going to do the maneuvers based on how well we know uh, our, our states and, and the other object state. With that, we'll use controls to design how we approach and, and how we behave. All of this has to account for the navigational uncertainty. So here's a couple of different um, ways that we do the RPO operations. Uh, for example, we have a classical two-impulse rendezvous. And so this notion is very similar uh, to perhaps like a, a home and transfer where we start with a single impulse to get us close to the target vehicle and then another impulse to match our state when we get there. This is typically analyzed in a local frame like the local vertical, local horizontal frame. Um, and that's kind of a classical first step sort of approach that we could use to do these types of operations. That's going to be our optimal case for small transfer times. But if our transfer times get to be uh, greater than about half of the target orbit period, then we're potentially going to be needing to use more impulses to do this. And so for larger transfer times, maybe three, four, several impulses would be necessary. Um, we also have the notion of traditional V-bar and R-bar approaches. And so this is going to be the sort of thing where we approach along the radial direction uh, for in our local frame 
or along the velocity or interact direction. Um, and so we can approach from behind or in front or behind or above or below. Um, we can take any combination of these that we need to be able to get where we're trying to go or to model the behavior of something approaching us. So the notion here, or the, the thought about, I've always been curious, why do we call it V-bar and R-bar approaches? Um, and my conclusion, or my, the result of my study is that when we first coined these phrases, when we put it into the literature, it was hard for us to put the vector notation into the literature. So we just called it V-bar and R-bar, and that, that caught on. Um, I don't know, that might be apocryphal, but. So we can combine a lot of these notions, uh, the, the V-bar, R-bar approach sort of things, uh, the impulsive type things, uh, and formulate a general glide slope approach. So in this case, we're going to use as many impulses as we need to or as we deem necessary to get us closer to the target. And this can allow for us to account for uh, changes in inclination, changes in other orbital parameters than just maybe the few that we would use with the V-bar and R-bar approach. And this helps us make that a more general approach. And then if we want to just like throw everything in there, we can go in and, and use the, the model predictive control theory. It's a much more, um, it's a, a popular thing that's growing on, it's catching on more and more. Um, in recent time, there's a lot of active research going on in that area. Um, and with this, it uses the notions of optimal control theory baked into the, the approaches that we're doing. And that allows for us to be able to use continuous thrust and do things in a more optimal way. So I get, now we're going to get to the point where we're going to look at some, some cool examples of this. And so I'll just go through a list here of a different number of options that you have when you're doing RPO type things. Um, so there's notions of being able to traverse waypoints about your target satellite. You might say, I want to fly a, a triangle about my target satellite or an octagon or some, some notion of waypoints near another satellite um, or some other object. And um, with that, you, you're able to do a lot of very interesting things, kind of basically force the motion as you need to do so. We also have notions of things like a teardrop trajectory. Uh, this uh, is one of the more elegant type solutions that I've seen. Uh, I can't, I'm really fond of this one. Uh, but basically, you, you utilize the natural dynamics to uh, maintain a, a shape of a teardrop near your target satellite. And you'll put in an impulse at a particular point in the orbit to maintain that behavior. Uh, but you leverage kind of both. the bo the best of both worlds there, you use the natural dynamics as well as control as you need to. Um, there's also notions of natural motion, natural motion circumnavigation. So this is where we just are offset in terms of our orbital elements, which allows us to circumnavigate about another object. Or we can force that motion if we want to do it faster. Uh, view bar offset, or perch points, or different corkscrew trajectories. There's a number of these different things, and we'll look at a couple of visuals in a moment. Um, all of this kind of all of these operations kind of come back to the same fundamental challenges, that of being able to know where we're at and where the target object is. Um, if we don't know those things well, then, then we're kind of stuck in the, dead in the water to begin with. So here's an example of a forced motion waypoint. Um, in this particular case, we start, we have the, the path of the yellow satellite forms a box uh, and in re respect to this target satellite. Um, and when I look at these things, kind of from my background, I always look at straight, straight lines in terms of orbital dynamics as being a weird sort of thing. Uh, but we can actually fly these types of missions where we can fly certain paths next to another satellite. I always want it to be curved, but, but it actually, we're able actually to do this very, very efficiently and for very little fuel. And so we can plan these maneuvers and, and do the sorts of things that you might not expect. Here's an example of one of those teardrop orbits. Um, so basically, we allow the natural motion to carry us in this path, and we, we perform an impulse every time we get to the bottom. Um, and that's, uh, I believe, every period. And that allows us to be able to maintain that formation um, with some offset distance from our target satellite. Or, um, then we have the notion of the, the f natural motion circumnav. This, again, is just say my target satellite is here and my orbital elements put me here, the natural motion is actually going to just carry me in an ellipse around my target satellite. Um, so being able to leverage that, be able to model that is very important. Then we have the notion of the, the corkscrew relative orbit. A lot like a circumnav, but now we're in a couple of different dimensions as well. Uh, rather than just being in the plane, we're going to fly a corkscrew around that trajectory. Um, it's kind of a, a cool looking thing. So with all of this, we kind of catch, catch the notion that 
these things can happen, they do happen, they're happening every day in space, other people are doing them, um, we need to be able to model them and understand them. And so for that, kind of where we come in at AGI, uh, we do have a number of tools that can help with this process. And so one of those tools I mentioned on the, at the onset is Astrogator. Um, Astrogator is a tool that allows us to perform simulations in very high fidelity models uh, in the space environment. Um, it also gives us the flexibility and the modularity to, to say maybe I don't want to be as high of fidelity, maybe I want to bring the fidelity down, um, and that gives us flexibility to design different strategies. So it's all very plug and play and swappable to do those types of approaches. Um, inside of Astrogator we have the notion of high precision orbit propagation. Uh, we can use differential corrections and numerical optimization to be able to find particular solutions. Um, we also have the notion of being able to um, use those tools to design particular approaches, different maneuvers or find the maneuver that we need to do a particular thing. Mm -hmm. With this sort of environment, then we can also design additional capabilities against that. So say I need to design a control algorithm, well now I have a realistic force model and, and a realistic environment to be able to design that control algorithm and evaluate its effectiveness. Another tool that I haven't mentioned yet is the Orbit Determination Toolkit. And so this used in conjunction with Astrogator um, allows us to be able to get good information regarding our navigation and our uncertainty, where we're at, where our, our target is at. So that's the thing that I've been coming back to all this time is that's our biggest challenge. So we can design all day a good approach, a good solution, um, but if we don't know where we're at, then we're gonna have trouble to be able to fly that. And so uh, with ODTK used in conjunction with Astrogator, we can have a much better idea of where we're at. Um, and one of the things that's kind of an ongoing effort and we've kind of kicked off and we're ramping up is tighter integration between Astrogator and ODTK, uh, being able to go back and forth from one tool to the other. So this kind of gives us a, a feel of what we can do to help with this. And kind of just to, to leave you, um, we kind of understand the notion of we need to know where we're at, we need to know where the other sp things are at or in space, things are at in space. Um, and with that, we need to be able to say, if we have something that's moving close to us and what it's doing, we need to be able to model that, be able to understand it. Um, so with all of that, the, the, the notion is that as these things get more and more common, we need to be able to respond to them. Um, and so if you have questions or other things you need to look at or other information you'd like to know, you can look at any of these resources. Um, they all start with agi.com and go on from there. So thanks.